Lord, we thank you and we celebrate you that when the storms are raging, we are safe in you. Today, even as I pray and as we worship and as we examine your word, someone is going to make a decision to say yes to your son. Someone's going to say, I, I want to be safe. I don't want to be in danger anymore. Thank you for fathering us, providing for us, protecting us, loving us. We thank you and we celebrate fatherhood and manhood this Lord's Day. Whether here in the room or whether online, would you bless every man under the sound of my voice? Would you cover every home by your spirit? Would you so now move in this preaching moment that you would heal and deliver according to your word, and that you would save for your name's sake? Speak, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. It's good. Good, good, good. So good to have y'all here. Good to be in worship. Happy Father's Day, brothers. Happy Father's Day. Type in Happy Father's Day if your dad is worshiping with you. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 2. I want to begin reading at verse 1 as we are in a series of messages that we're calling Rise and Build. Nehemiah chapter 2. I want to begin reading at verse 1 and read down to verse number 8. Either in your Bible or on the screen, if you have it, say, I've got it. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Scriptures, and we find these words. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad? seeing you are not sick. This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. The king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for. The good hand of my God was upon me can have your seats in the presence of God and at home. I want to preach from the subject this Father's Day when God's hand is on you. Come on, just put your hands on yourself and say, I want God's hands on me. When God's hands is on your life. Today, we obviously honor fathers, grandfathers, uncles, and the men who have filled important roles in our lives, significant lives in the lives of our families, our church, our community. And I want to be really clear that on this Lord's Day, y'all should help me do this, we salute fathers and men in our lives. It's my prayer that as this day transpires, that in some real way it will be obvious, it will be communicated, the importance of manhood and fatherhood to all of us. I don't know about you, but I could reflect upon the life of my father and I could say that I learned a lot from my father. As a matter of fact, the funny thing about learning about people is they don't just teach us what to do, 
Some of you can finish that. They teach us what not to do. We have been given various models of manhood, models of fatherhood in our society. And I want us to be very clear that there is no such thing as my own man. I knew I wouldn't get a lot of amens for that. I'm either a man after the first Adam who introduced sin into the world, or I'm a man after the second Adam who is Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul affirms this in his writings in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, the 15th verse, he says, For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, Christ abounded to many. The greatest man to have ever lived is without doubt Jesus Christ. And as men, we either embody the personhood of the first Adam or the personhood of the second Adam. In our text today, we find a man by the name of Nehemiah, a man who can teach us what it looks like when God has his hand on a man's life. Jesus. Nehemiah had just heard about the desperate, the desperate situation of his people were facing back in Jerusalem. Stay close, I'm going somewhere. He has concerns about his people that have now saturated his life. If we were to pay attention to what we learned previously in chapter 1, we will discover that there is a progression of his will that occurs in Nehemiah's life. The progression is that it opens with an interest that has deepened into concern. And from interest to concern, it matures into passion. One more time, it starts as an interest, it deepens to concern, and then it matures to passion. And this is the way Nehemiah is teaching us, the way he has come to understand. And as we pick up the story in chapter 2, Nehemiah for four months has been agonizing. For four months he's been mourning. For four months he's been fasting. For four months he's been praying. This is where you're going to shout. And now he's ready to act. I want to park here for a moment. That's why verse 1 opens up with, and it came to pass. I want to sit on that for just one hot minute, and I want to encourage somebody that at some point, it's time to stop mourning and to stop praying and to stop fasting, and it's time to start acting. And I believe in this season that God has us in, that God is speaking to the church of the living God, and he's saying, this is your season to act. As a matter of fact, help me for a moment and tell somebody around you, type it on online, this is your season to act. When it says it came to pass, you need to grab this. Most of us misinterpret this, Audrey. When we interpret Lucinda, it came to pass, we usually interpret it that something now is ending. But that's not what pass means in the Hebrew. The word pass means occur. And it came to occur. Y'all missed it. It means in the Hebrew, happen. It came to happen. It doesn't mean something is about to end. It means something is about to begin. And I feel the Lord speaking to us, saying, you know what? Don't worry about the past. This is the day something is about to happen. This is the day something is about to occur in your life. For four months, he's been fasting and mourning and praying. And now God says, I got you in a moment where something is about to happen. Don't miss this, four months, four months. What, what, why so long? Why so long? Why, why does God move him from, from this place of, of concern, from this place of interest to concern to passion? Why does God move him this way? He moves him this way because before you can do anything significant for God, you just can't have interest. You just can't have concern. Somebody's going to help somebody. You've got to have passion for that thing. 
when the, the week from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, which is what we call, which is what we call Passion Week, that was not a week where Jesus was operating in interest. It was not a week where he was operating in concern. It was a week where he was operating in passion. And I think too many of us are failing at what we start to do because I do it out of interest or out of concern and I don't do it out of passion. Can I tell you why I need to do it out of passion? Because the bottom is going to fall out. Because the enemies are going to come after you. Because the life and the road is going to be hard. And the thing that keeps me in the fight, preach Pastor Galeon, I say what keeps me in the fight is I got this thing digging deep down on the inside that says I can't help myself. If I go through hardship, I'm going anyway. If I go through setback, I'm going anyway. If I fail every once in a while, I'm going anyway. Somebody shout, I got passion for this thing. Jesus would have never made it from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. He went through six trials. Y'all didn't hear me. I said six trials. Three by Jewish leaders and three more trials by the Romans. And during the time, he survived beating and whipping and mocking. But it did not matter because God built up a passion in me. Nehemiah spends four months with God moving him to a place of passion. I'm about to speak this over somebody's life. What God has you to do is going to require passion from you. Can I, I got to park here. I'm trying to give you the first point, but I got to park here for just a moment. See, you need passion because victories don't come quick. You need passion because for as many as are for you, there's another element that are not for you. You need passion because I need more than just a good idea, more than just a degree. I need more. Is there anybody listening to me that could look back over your life and say lots of folk have started, but they refused to finish because they didn't have passion? Where my young people? You can't go to college because it's what your mama and daddy want you to do. you got to go because you got a passion, a passion to make a difference, a passion to change society, a passion to be used by God. If I'm going to be successful, i got to move to passion. Nehemiah now after four months, has been moved to a place of passion. And he teaches us four things that happen when God's hand is on your life. First thing that he teaches us, Ryan, when God's hand is on your life, is that number one, there has to be preparation. (laughs) I'm in verse two of the text. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year, King of Artaxerxes, actually the first verse, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I just said something. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, wine is brought before him. This is not just any old day. This is not just any old day where where Nehemiah is up to his normal government job of testing wine for poison and quality. No, 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 no. If you were to read it, even the NIV does a good job of this translation. It literally says when wine was brought before him. Literally in the Hebrew, it says wine was before him. Why does that matter? Because it suggests some kind of special day. It's it's some kind of special moment. Nehemiah was recognizing that his moment of opportunity had occurred. Now, I want you to jot something down, and I don't want you to forget this, relative to preparation. Nehemiah teaches us that the first element of preparation, this is going to bless somebody, if nobody but James Gallier, the first element of preparation, you're going to be surprised, is active waiting. See, 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 I've already told you, sometimes I blow it. Can I, can I, can I give you a quick James Gale, your testimony? I have a few on this Father's Day. I'm so glad that God did not do some stuff when I asked at certain times in my life. 
See, I, I thought I was ready. I'll never forget feeling so deflated and so defeated every time I applied for an open pulpit and they, they either they didn't interview me at all, they wouldn't ask me to come preach a trial sermon, or I would get down to the last two or three and they would hit rejection on me. And I remember walking around thinking, God, did you call me or didn't you call me? And now I recognize that I wasn't ready for what I was asking God to do. And you have to have a moment in a season of your life of asking Active waiting. It, it, see, wisdom practice is active waiting. He's got this passion. He's got this moment. See, you can, don't miss this. Don't miss this. I don't want to get ahead of myself in the sermon there, but I need you to get this. He wasn't on sabbatical for four months. That means the whole four months he's been sitting with this, he was still serving the king. But those four months he didn't say anything. And just because he wasn't, he wasn't doing anything does not mean his waiting was not active. And I think we live in a society where we don't realize that I can be waiting and active at the same time. I'm going to drop anchor here for just a moment and preach this point. See, can I tell you why active waiting matters? In term, most of us think preparation is let me go get a degree. And that has its place. Let me go get a bank loan. That has its place. Let me go get my resources. That has its place. Let, let, let me go get my credit straight. That has its place. Let me go get some counsel. That has its place. Let me go get some tutoring. That has its place. But active waiting is deeper than that. A, a, a purpose, active waiting, watch this. He does not stop being the cupbearer. Even though he knows that God has put his passion somewhere else. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because before God can bless you in Jerusalem, I got to learn to be faithful in my current position. Do I have anybody that you don't really like where God has you, but you know if God gonna move you from here, I got to do this thing well. I got to do this thing to his glory. I got to do this. And see, most of us look at where people are and they got the good job now. They happy with what God is doing now. But you don't know the years that they spent wishing they were somewhere else. But they said, you know what? I'm going to actively wait. I'm going to wait because I'm going to be faithful right where God has placed me. Woo. So look at somebody say, be faithful where he's placed you. See? I, I, can I, can I, let me give y'all three elements very fast. Three elements of active waiting. Everybody say active waiting. I, my God, I've been there. I've been there. While I was waiting for an opportunity to start a church or to pastor a church, I was preaching in storefronts in front of five, six, seven people. And I was just actively waiting because my attitude was, God, if you're going to do, some of you don't recognize this, your next position, your next opportunity, your next breakthrough is contingent upon your faithfulness of where God has you right now. Well, if God would just give me a better marriage, I'll be faithful and happy. If God would bless me with more money, I'll be faithful and happy. If God would just give me my home, I'll be faithful and happy. Don't you dare kid yourself. You got to learn to be faithful and happy in whatever state. Come on, Paul. Preach to us at Word Tabernacle. In whatever state I find myself, I've learned to be content. If I had much, if I had little, if I was up, if I was down, I've learned to be faithful right where I am oh God an unfaithful single person can never be a faithful married person preach Pastor Gallium because faithfulness has nothing to do with if I'm in my premier situation it's how God has anointed me to endure right where I am see everybody say active waiting Yo, God, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to move on, get out of this sub point. Some of you looking at where folk are right now, and you think they always had it like that. Come on, how many people can testify? If you don't want to lift your hands, you can wink at me. How many folk can testify? I didn't always have it like this. Now, I, I wasn't always able to pay my bills ahead of time. I wasn't always driving what I wanted. I wasn't always able to vacation the way I wanted. I just learned to actively wait. And while my friends were on cruise trips, I was happy just going to downtown Raleigh. While my friends were going overseas, I was good just being right where I was. 
because I've learned to actively wait. And I actively wait because I know that I've got to show God I can be faithful where he's placed me. Who am I preaching to that's made up in your mind that you can be faithful where he's placed you? Act of waiting. This is how preparation works. All of this is in verse 1 of chapter 2. In the month of Nisan. This is after all of this act of waiting for four months. And I actively wait because I've got to be faithful where God has placed me. But it's going to give you something to shout about. I'm still in preparation. Let me tell you the second thing that happens in act of waiting. The second thing that happens in act of waiting is that if I'm faithful where he's placed me, then I'm making a statement in my faithfulness that I'm expecting God to, I'm expecting God to provide the right opportunity. Oh, Pastor, you, man, I'm, I'm on this job. You think I'm acting like this because I want to be here for retirement? I don't want to retire from here. But I just, I have enough faith that if I'm faithfully serving God here, he's going to provide me the right opportunity. Is there anybody that can look back over your life and say, I'm, I'm, I'm where I am because God provided the right opportunity. Come on, is there anybody that... It, who would have ever thought a city boy would leave Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and come to Rocky Mount, North Carolina? And after 16 years, look at what the Lord has done. And this is no, this is no Pat James Gallier on the back. This is just simply to encourage somebody that if you stay faithful where God has you, God sees you and God is going to provide the right opportunity for you. If I were you, I would stop looking down for where people are right now because God is about to promote them. God is about to put favor on their life. God is about to give them a spirit of advancement. He's going to provide the right opportunity. And the last thing that happens in my act of waiting is not only do I have to learn to be faithful where God has placed me, and not only in that place do I expect God to provide the right opportunity, but also it gives me time to plan for when God provides the right opportunity. Some of y'all are going to be shocked by what I'm about to say. I don't want to mess up the sermon. But if God showed up tomorrow, tonight, and said, what do you want? Most of you don't have a prepared answer. See, don't, 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 don't miss the text. When, when, when the king says to him, what do you want? He, he, he says, I said a quick prayer. But it was a quick prayer because he had already been praying about it. And so we have to recognize that in the moment of preparation, it starts with active waiting are y'all with me but here's the second element of preparation i'm sorry y'all i got three things to say about active waiting not only is it about preparation but the second element of active waiting is about my attitude now you have to understand eastern religion eastern monarchs were sheltered according to esther chapter four eastern monarchs were sheltered kings were sheltered Oh, good Lord, I'm about to shout when I say this, right? They were sheltered, watch this, Kendra, from anything that would bring them unhappiness. Can, can, can I put a quick pin in it just for, can we just part, we'll leave the car idling, I won't stay long, but can we be honest, how good would life be if God started sheltering me from anything working my nerves? If he started sheltering me from anything that brings me unhappiness? He starts sheltering me from anything that's holding down my spirit. They were prohibited from being exposed to anything that would bring them down. So watch this. So much to the point that when he showed up at work every day, what he was sitting with didn't show up on his face. So much to the point that when it finally shows up this specific day, the king says, what's wrong with you today? Because I'm used to being around you. And you know you can't come in here looking like that. Because as this is why the text says, that Nehemiah was severely afraid. Because if I was to make the king unhappy, he would have the right to kill me. Can I park here and just insert this real quick, y'all? 
We have to learn to do a better job of showing up in front of the king with a sad countenance. Wait, I'm, I'm not saying, y'all, hang in there for just a moment. I know we all have some bad days. We all have some down days. But come on. The joy of the Lord should be your strength. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. And even every day, come on, come on, y'all. Every day can't be a bad day. Every day can't be a down day. Every day can't be a woe is me day. Generally speaking, I will come into the king's countenance with, Lord, I want to bless you with a smile on my face. As a matter of fact, your praise would sound better if you sang it with a smile. Now watch this because you're going to think this is a contradiction, but it is not. I am not suggesting, this is going to help counseling purpose. I'm not suggesting that you should always suppress your emotions. I need to park here. We as men need to hear this. We can't keep suppressing our emotions. At some point, if it's hurting, I need to show it's hurting. Preach Pastor Gail here. At some point, I've got to recognize that I can't keep suppressing how I'm feeling. That, y'all, if we were to be honest, life is full of emotional distress. Let me tell you what we lack. We don't lack intelligence. We lack emotional intelligence. See, let me help you all for a moment. I'm working on this because as a man, I typically react and not respond. But in my emotional intelligence, I'm learning I can't react to all what y'all doing. See, some of y'all, you, you can't keep reacting to how folk treat you. See, reaction is unconscious. Reaction is where I get this emotional trigger and I behave in a way that expresses the relief of my emotions. This is why somebody could do a little thing to you and you fly off the handle. What God is leading us to is having a more conscious response where instead of me reacting, I'm deciding on how I'm going to behave. And we as men, especially, I want to say this on Father's Day, we got to do a better job. At, at some point, I, I'm going to tell you the folks that make me nervous, the folk that just don't never cry. They don't never show no, up, they never upset. They, they don't nothing ever get to them. They, they, they the kind of folk, they the kind of folk that shoot up the church. Yep, yep. I'm going to talk to this side of the room. Y'all, they, they, they the kind of folk that you say, wait, she, she killed her husband when? These are the young boys that are shooting each other up in the streets. We as believers have got to learn how to have emotional intelligence. Well, I have to recognize that I'm sitting with something and I can't sit with it any longer. And this is Nehemiah's situation. I've been sitting with this thing for four months. And now, King, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the risk. You might kill me. You're going to see my sad countenance. But how in the world am I supposed to smile with everything I got going on? And you would be amazed. God is going to help somebody. You would be amazed how many people are serving faithfully but are struggling with their emotions. Am I the only one that's been there preaching a sermon but struggling? Have you ever sang a song and been struggling? Have you ever played a note and been struggling? Have you ever served at the door and been struggling? We've got to recognize there are bunches of folk that are faithful but struggling with their emotions. You're going to hear me say more about this over the months ahead. But I'm learning to, I'm going to lead our congregation on a series of moments where we are celebrating our victories and grieving our losses. Because every time there's a loss, I can't act like it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. 
Come on. We, and every time we win, it, we shouldn't be so busy to get to the next win that we don't take a moment and clap our hands and celebrate and say to ourselves, God did this. As a matter of fact, before I move on any further, would you think about one victory God has given you? And then would you put your hands together and begin celebrating that one victory? If you're online watching, go ahead and put in some clappy hand emojis. Now do this real fast. Find you somebody real fast. I know you can't get too close to them, but find you somebody and let them tell you one victory that God has given them. And then after they tell you the one victory, don't you clap for them, clap for yourself, clap for them. Can you clap for what God has done for somebody else in somebody else's life? Step one, everybody say preparation. Now this is about to get tight. I'm glad we shouted a little bit. The next three points are going to go fast. After I get prepared, the next thing I need if God's hand is going to be on my life is I need permission. <laughs> um, see, I have to have faith enough to wait. Ooh, ooh. And I also need faith enough to ask. Here's the problem. He can't do anything about what he's feeling unless the king gives him permission to go. Ooh, ooh. He needed approval. Everybody say approval. He needed approval of the king. He, he could not work in Jerusalem without, watch this, the authority of Artaxerxes. So he asked Artaxerxes, this is going to make me run around this room on Father's Day. Because y'all missed it. Don't miss it in the reading. The cupbearer is asking King Artaxerxes to make him governor of Judah. It, it, you, you, y'all, y'all missing this. See, in order to do anything that God really wants you to do, you need permission because sometimes the only thing I've got going for me is that I was sent. <sighs> Y'all, let's read the text again. Let, let, let's read the text one more time. Why is your face seeing you? It's not sick. There's nothing but sadness of heart. And he says, I say it to the king, verse 3, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad, given the place, watch that, the place of my father's grace? The king said to me, where are you requesting? He said, I pray the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight. Are y'all reading the same Bible? That you, y'all not, y'all not talking with me now. That you send me. This... There's been moments in my life where my degrees did not help. There's been times where the people I knew didn't help. Maybe y'all want to listen to Moses preach today. Moses, when God sends you to Pharaoh to tell his people to let him go, you, you had concerns, and you said to God, the people aren't going to receive me. What should I say to them? You should tell them that I am sent you. But God, I can't talk good, but you've been sent. God, I don't have connections in the land, but you've been sent. I don't know who I'm talking to. At the end of the day, sometimes that really what matters is I've been sent. You could not like how I preach, but I've been sent. You may not like our programs, but I've been sent. Is there anybody that can look back over your life and say, God has blessed me right where I am because the one thing I had going for me is that I was sent. Ooh, God. It's Father's Day. Let me help somebody understand something. Sending compensates for your shortcomings. One more time. Sending compensates for your shortcomings. 
I know folk then that's got the resume, but they went. They missed it. They, they, they got all of the right stuff on it, but they weren't sent by anybody. They just decided to go on out there on their own. And I'm here to tell you, when the bottom falls out, you need a covering. You need somebody bigger than you and higher than you and more powerful than you that can say, I sent them. Can I help this live on, on, on Father's Day? There's been some times, Angela, when I was growing up, that I did not feel like going to school. So I did not go voluntarily. And my mama, mama, I got a fever. I don't wanna go to school today. I'm sending, I'm sending you anyway. See, this is why as parents, we get upset when our children don't act right. Because you're not there under your authority. You're there under my authority. So I need you to act like a gailure. I need you to act like a child of God. I need to act like you've been sent. <sighs> we, we live in this society of individualism and independence and not interdependence. When I, when I look at the resumes of people, people that now call themselves, I'm not here to, I ain't here to pick no fights today, it's Father's Day. People that call themselves apostles and bishops and evangelists. My question is, who sent you? Come on, when musicians are playing, I wanna know who sent you. Listen to when folk are singing, who sent them? And I'll tell y'all a little story real fast. I don't know how many of y'all remember Dr. Albert Lee, who pastored North End Missionary Baptist Church probably for some 40 years. When I got to this city to pastor, Dr. Lee had already been pastoring his church for over 30, maybe 35 years. In the early years of arriving, he was not that warm with me. He wasn't that warm with me because he spent years, 40 years, as president of NAACP. He spent his life in the arena of social justice and gospel ministry. And then here comes this young preacher, 40 years old, in the city that he'd been pastoring for 35 years, talking about, can we do some stuff together around social justice and community development? And he, he wasn't having it. A couple years later, I went to Hampton Ministers Conference. I'm about to cry. I went to Hampton's Ministers Conference, the largest gathering of black pastors in the world. I went to Hampton's Ministers Conference. I got to Hampton Ministers Conference, and Dr. Lee was talking to Dr. James Samuel Hall. I walked up to Pastor Hall. As soon as he saw me, he said, son, I didn't know you were coming. He stopped this conversation with Dr. Lee. Pastor Hall hugged me. He looked at Dr. Lee and said, this is my son. From that moment forward, I didn't have no more problems with Dr. Lee. Not because of James Galliard, but because he found out who sent me. And there's a whole bunch of folk, you out there all by yourself with no covering, and you need to have somebody that can say they sent you. Oh, God. That's why you gotta be careful how you treat folk. Cause I didn't come to this city under my own authority and my own power. I got a daddy. And if you don't treat me right, my daddy gonna come get you. And you gotta make up in your mind. I didn't just get here by myself. Somebody sent me. I can't rebuild the wall unless you send me. I can't sing a song until you send me. I can't do a note till you send me. I can't start a church until you send me. I need permission. I need preparation. I'm done, I'm done. I'll make these last too quick. Because after he gets permission, watch this Brandon, then he asks for protection. <laughs> verse 7 verse 7 well since you've given me permission to go um, 
would you give me some letters to make sure that while I'm out there, won't nothing happen to me? Can I tell you what's our problem? Whole bunch of times we seek God's protection, but we never got his permission. I'm going to be quick now. Protection means, Mr. King, would you give me favor for the journey? Well, would you make sure that I won't experience oppression? Would you make sure that my enemies won't get me? Would you make sure that I don't fall prey to traps and schemes? Would you make sure that every valley gets exalted and the crooked places are made straight and the rough places are made smooth? Would you make sure that Satan's grip is broken? Would you make sure that your preferential treatment is on me? (sighs) Favor. When God's hand is on you, his protection is on you. I'm done. I'm done. Then this blows my mind, Ryan. It blows my mind because he's basically, he's basically soliciting the enemies of his people to not only release him on paid duty, but protect him from every enemy, promote him to governor, and then pay for the wall to get built. Which is my last point, provision. And I'm gonna say the same thing I said about protection. If you want God's provision, then I need God's permission first. So he requests letters of authority that will provide the materials. Can I go back real fast? I'm I'm about to get us out of here. This goes back to preparation. He had studied who the person was that kept the forest. He doesn't say to him, you know that guy you got on payroll that takes care of the timber? No, he says, and would you get a letter to Asaph? He's saying, God, I need you to finance this journey. And y'all, none of us should doubt how God has been providing in our life. As I close this message on Father's Day, is there anybody that can look over your life and say, as I look back over my life, God has been providing for me? (laughs) Y'all don't act like it. Come on, can you celebrate the fact? Let me give you some things that he's provided. Can anybody here say he's provided me the very life I'm living? He's provided me the air that I'm breathing. He's provided me the earth and the world that I live in. He's provided me the word that I need to live by. He's provided me mercy. He's provided me Jesus as my sacrifice. And everything that my soul needs, my God has provided. Somebody shout, the Lord has provided. He's provided me the joy I need. He's provided me the power and the strength I need. He's provided me the mercy and the self-control I need. Everything I've needed, thy hand has provided. Lord, you've been faithful in providing for us. Now, I'm done. Let me tell you where we are in this text. I'm done preaching. I don't want to preach long on Father's Day. Look at what... The earthly throne of Artaxerxes does. The earthly throne of Artaxerxes gives favor to God's man, funds what he's doing, sees the struggle and the countenance and the emotions on him, and grants him protection over every enemy. Don't miss this. If a heathen throne on the earth by Artaxerxes would do all this, what do you think a heavenly throne of God would do for his children that love him and are called by his name? If Artaxerxes can do this, how much more can my God do? Which is why you need to be in a relationship with him.
which is why you need to know him. And so whether you're watching online, whether you're in the room, all I've tried to do on this Father's Day is to show you what it looks like when God's hand is on your life. When God's hand is on your life, you will go through a season of preparation. When God's hand is on your life, before you move, you will ask permission. When God's hand is on your life, he will bless you with protection. And he will bless you with provision. And pastor, why does that matter? Because that means whatever God does, man won't be able to wrestle it away from me. You're watching online, you're in the room. Without a personal relationship with the Lord, without a church home where you're growing. If this king in this text can do this much, imagine what God can do for you if you surrender your life to him. And so if you're watching online and you don't have a relationship with him, there's links being provided which you type in, I want to be saved, I want a church home. If you're in the room, I know we expect that everybody here has a church home. We, we expect everybody here is saved, but that may not be the case. So, Pastor, what do I need to do? I want you to have enough faith. I want you to have enough courage to step out of the seat, come down one of these aisles. These altar counselors are waiting to receive you. Don't worry about who's looking. We're not here to judge you. We're here to celebrate with you. And so while the praise team lifts up this, this invitation, I want us to take a moment in our own lives. If you're already saved, I want you to take a moment, reflect upon what God is doing in your life. To reflect upon God, do I have the permission, the protection, the favor to do what you're calling me to do? And so come on, let's just lift this up together. We're going to just worship one last time before, before we close service. If you're online watching, come on, start making decisions. To you. Thank you, God. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. I surrender all, all to you. Out of church home, you've been gone from church, away from church. God is saying, it's time to come back. Pandemic is ending, it's time for you to come home. You left Word Tabernacle a year ago, three years ago, five years ago, seven years ago, ten years ago, and you know God has got you right there like, I need to come back home. We want you to come back home. If you're watching online, I want you to go ahead and type that in. I want to be safe. Click on that link. Click on that radio button. Come on, y'all. One voice. Let's sing this as a whole congregation. Come on, lift it up together. Everything I give, I give to you. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. If you're in the room, if you're online, this is your moment to make your decisions. So I want to pray to seal this sermon. I want to pray for our offering. I want you to jot down what I'm about to say before I pray. Because I don't want you to miss this. Somebody's going to need to tweet this out. You're going to need to post this out. I don't want you to miss that. Play that real soft for me, Ryan. I want you to catch what I'm about to say. Nehemiah 
starts off faithfully serving Trishanda as the cupbearer. As a result of him serving faithfully as cupbearer, he gets a 12-year appointment to governor of Jerusalem. Now, I want you to get this. He gets the promotion while serving. This is what I want you to jot down. Promotion to leadership comes best through servanthood. Promotion to leadership comes best through servanthood. Which is why every member should be serving. Every member serving. So I want to seal this word in prayer. I want to seal the offering. And then after we conclude services, for those of you who want to leave, you'll be free to do that. For those of you who want to remain, we have what's called the altar. There'll be ministers here with anointing oil. And if you want to be anointed, you want to be prayed for, or if you want to pray for your family member, your husband or your wife, you're invited to do that as well. And so come on, let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this word today. And my prayer, God, is that we would be a congregation of men and women, boys and girls, that we can say without any fear of hesitation or contradiction that God's hand is on my life. God, thank you for what you're doing in this season. God, my prayer today is that we would take seriously this season of preparation that you have us in. God, would you help us to practice active waiting? I'm going to be faithful right where I am. And you, Lord, are going to provide the opportunity. I know you will. God, would you help me to seek permission before I do anything? Help it that it can be said of me, I was sent by. That I just didn't pick up and do my own thing but that I had a covering, a covering that in the midst of that covering gave me protection. In the midst of that permission, you gave me provision. And so my prayer today, God, is that you would raise us up as men and women that our sending would compensate for our shortcomings. I pray for homes, marriages, and men especially this Father's Day, I pray for men. I pray, God, and I thank you for the example of Nehemiah that shows us the value and the power of submitting to authority, the value and the power of having passion. So my prayer now, God, is that you would cover every person, that God, that you would grant us favor, that you would grant us preferential treatment, that you would give us victory in every area of our lives. I thank you for those that are making decisions. And God, would you go ahead and finance the journey? Would you grant us favor financially to do everything that you've called us to do? Would you cover our young people as they go off to college campuses, God, that you would cover them with scholarships, God? God, as people start businesses, that you would give them favor with financing. God, as as the work of the church continues to be built and we continue to grow in ministry, God, provide everything we need financially. And to that end, God, I now pray for the offering. God, we know that in the room we don't actually pass offering baskets anymore. God, for those who are giving in envelopes today, as they leave at the end of service to drop them in receptacle boxes in the hallway or at the rear of the building, for those that are giving digitally or online, ACX, text giving, for those who are driving by to drop off their offering. God, I pray that you would use the offering for the building of your kingdom, the spread of your word, and the glorifying of your name. God, I thank you for what you're doing in this season. I pray a release of your choice and assorted blessings upon your people. And now as we prepare to leave this space, we know we never leave your presence. For you promised always to be with us and to be with us until the end of the age. For all that you're doing and for who you are, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we clap our hands and give God thanks in here?
For those of you who are ready to be dismissed, you are dismissed. Happy Father's Day. The altar is open. I give you all of me. I give you all of me. I give